Last Sunday evening, we looked at the fact that the Bible shows to us that Russia will invade Israel. And from Ezekiel chapter 38 to chapter 39, we see that the military power is going to be judged. And that judgment will be of Russia. This evening, from Revelation chapter 17 and through to chapter 18, we have Christ's words given to us of the judgment that is going to come upon a spiritual power. And when we go to the first verse of chapter 17, we find that one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials dealt with in the previous chapter, one of those angels, the seventh, talked with John saying, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Come hither, John was told, to see the judgment that was going to come. And John saw a picture of this woman sitting upon another beast here. And this picture is one of a future judgment. It's still future. The event has not yet occurred. In Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter, Revelation chapter 17, we have prophecies of our day, the latter days. And brethren, sisters and young people, we need to be alert to what is happening in our day. We are that generation that is going to see the fulfilment of many things that are in Ezekiel 38, 39, or 37, 38, 39, and Revelation 17 and 18. Revelation 17 really is a chapter of current events. And this evening we'll try and run through a little bit of the history of some of the events that we are familiar with, some because of history, some that are happening now. It's a chapter of current events. Verse 1, here's this woman sitting upon a beast. It's a worldwide system that is being prophesied. In verse 15, of chapter 17, the waters which thou sawest where that woman sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. It's a worldwide picture that we're being told by Christ. Verse 3, seven heads on this beast. Verse 9, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And then in verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now keep in mind when Christ was giving these words to John to record. AD 96. Who's in control? Rome. Who's the city? Rome. And it's interesting, there are the seven hills of Rome today. Not big hills, but there are seven hills of Rome. And coins minted around the time just before and would have been in circulation at the time when Revelation was written, minted in 71 AD under the reign of Vespasian. There's the goddess Roma sitting on the seven hills of Rome. In South Australia, we have Seven Hill, a township north of Adelaide, south of Clare, Seven Hill, it's not Seven Hills, Seven Hill is the name of it. 
but it was based on the seven hills of Rome because Jesuits first settled there in 1848, they planted vines in 1850 and they took the name from the seven hills of Rome, the Jesuits that settled in that place. They struck cuttings actually from the Spanish vine and it's still run today by Jesuits. So in a very state, we have a reminder, Revelation 17. So this chapter and the next chapter of Revelation speaks about the judgment of the papacy. God will come into remembrance of that great city. The papacy viewed by God, we read in verse 1, was as an adulteress. Having lost the truth to Christianity, the apostasy developed out of the truth taught by Christ and the apostles. It was already happening in the days of the writers like the Apostle Paul and Peter. The apostasy had already started to come in as the truth was changed. And it's in the second of Thessalonians, which we will look at for a few minutes, that we have some of the details as we see it from the Apostle Paul's point of view. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we ask ourselves, and we know how every chapter talks about the coming of Christ, and so here in verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that was his theme, he had been travelling around all the ecclesias, preaching, now he had to put pen to paper. Some suggest that Thessalonians was the first letter that he wrote. He needed a thing. What did he choose? The coming of Christ. Was the coming of Christ soon? Did he say the return of the Lord Jesus Christ was about to come? No. Verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that that day of Christ is at hand. No, it's not at hand. Why not? Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Christ knew what was going to come. When he wrote this, uh, sorry, when Apostle Paul wrote this letter, he knew he was speaking about things that he had, would have known and understood from the teachings of Christ. Here's Paul's view. Paul didn't have the book of Revelation, but he did have Daniel's prophecies. And he would have been familiar with Daniel chapter 7. There was the fourth beast, the Roman beast, the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's image, Eastern Rome and Western Rome. And he would have remembered and understood there was that little horn that came up replacing other horns, the eyes of a man, a mouth speaking great things. Paul knew, uh, Paul knew that prophecy. There had to come a great apostasy. Revelation revealed the details. Not available to Paul, but available to us here in the 21st century. And Paul's simplicity of argument gave the main features of the apostasy. You just reflect upon it. First of all, it was religious. It's an apostasy. It was headed up by individuals. He used the term man of sin, the popes. Then you come down to verse 4 who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Claiming divine power, this system, this apostasy, would claim that they had divine authority. And then in verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, was already working in the days of Paul. 
and in verse 10, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness, there'll be a deceptiveness about it. This system will mesmerise the world. It would be a worldwide ruling authority when Christ returns. So from that, there can only be one system, and that's the Roman system, the Roman papacy. So we go over to Revelation 17, in verse 2. This system, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Many peoples, Christ is telling John, will be intoxicated by her teachings. That's the same language that was applied to Babylon the Great in Jeremiah. Babylon hath been a golden cup in Yahweh's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Now, in Scripture, pure wine is a symbol of divine truth. Wine that is not pure speaks of false doctrines. And it said in verse 2 that the kings of the earth have committed. They've sought patronage. They've sought favour of Rome. It's a historic feature of Rome's relationship with the powers of the earth. You think about some of the examples in history of the influence of Rome and how the kings wanted to be there. We'll go back to 1929. Mussolini in Italy. That's a rare colour photo. Not many coloured photographs around that time. That's quite a rare one. But there's Mussolini inspecting his Italian troops. He's sing, seeking to bring order to the country. What did he do? He signed a concordant in 1929. He signed it with the Vatican. Mussolini signing it. Cardinal Gaspari signing it. So what's so significant about that? 1929. Prior to 1929, going back to 1870, in 1870, Garibaldi, a great Italian general who was elected to government, kicked out the papacy off any land. And there's actually a sketch showing the papacy getting the boot out of Italy. They didn't have any temporal power after Garibaldi. Now they've got temporal power again in 1929. Here it is, the Vatican City. It's approximately one square kilometre, the Vatican area. You can see across the top, there's in miles, that's one eighth of a mile there. But it's got temporal power. Incredible. A state with its own right. Ambassadors all around the world has its own stamps to temporal power. And there's the Vatican today. And the flag flies. It's a temporal power. And there's the Holy See, a permanent United Nations observer. This is the latest one, 2016, in that position. Archbishop Ivan Djokovic. At the UN. The Holy See. 
the little horn. The eyes of a man. A mouth speaking great things. The holy sea. There at the UN. Now let's come to another situation. Another incident in history. January the 30th, 1933. Adolf Hitler came to power as the Chancellor of the German Reich. It sealed the destruction of the constitutional government of Germany. And in its place arose one of the cruelest and most barbaric powers in history, Hitler. And here you have some photographs. These are coloured ones which were quite rare. He actually had a personal photographer, a man called Hugo Jaser, and he went everywhere with Hitler, Hitler and he took coloured photographs. He was one of the few people to be taking coloured photographs at that time in history. And when 1945 came, he went and hid all those photographs. And then in 1965, he sold them to Life magazine for a fortune. And here they are today. Well, there's a Nazi rally in 1937. Here's Hitler's Berlin in 1938. Here's someone rising to power. Here's a force in the earth, Germany. And we all know the story with the Jews. Where does the Vatican fit into this? There was a Vatican Nazi alliance made in 1933. And there's one von Pepin, and there's Fuseli. He was later to become Pope Pius XII. And here was an alliance between the papacy and Hitler. Here's mass being held in Munich in 1937 to bless the Nazi party. That photograph was taken by a man called Walter, Herbert Walter, and he wrote a book called Hitler. This writer joined the youth, the Hitler Youth, in 1933. He joined the SS in 1940, and he had all the recollections and all the knowledge and the know-how of what was happening in the system. And later on, he wrote this book on Hitler. And there's a photograph. Mass being held in Munich. Here's 1938. All these photographs coming out now. World War II. There's the link with Italy, Mussolini and so on. And then you think of the last three popes. Wherever they've gone, go back to Pope John Paul II in particular, wherever they have moved, all leaders want to have a photo taken with the Pope. See, the kings of the earth have committed. They want to be seen with the Pope. A leader on the world stage was taken out of our newspaper. A leader on the world stage. Nations and people and tongues and waters He's a worldwide system. He's going to change the system. Well, what's the sort of system? It's like that. There they are, flat on their stomachs, worshipping Pope John Paul in the Vatican. That's the sort of system. You recall when Pope John Paul died, Fortress Vatican, our newspapers had, the city locked down as what? All the world leaders went to Rome to farewell the pontiff. You might remember some of these photographs. Here was one. There was the mass that was being held. If 
But what's the little ring around? You won't be able to see it. It's Prince Charles. He was there. Prince Charles, the monarch, the supreme governor of the Church of England, is there in the audience. And an article came out at that time that said, Prince has said that he wants to be seen as a defender of all religious faiths. That's the Church of England and its leadership. The head of the Church of England. And you go back in history and you look at the era of the Reformation and how they came out of that system. And now look. The kings knew what they were doing. The verse said, the kings of the earth, in verse 2, have committed it. They know what they're doing. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. They don't really know what they're doing, but they like it. Well, then Pope Benedict came on the scene. You might remember this photograph, World Youth Day in Sydney. There he was in the Pope Mobile. There with all the people waving their flags, probably whose grandparents suffered at the system. But the kings of the earth have committed. Pope Benedict went to Auschwitz. It was in 2006. And if you think about it, what a blasphemous act, knowing that the Roman Catholic system was instrumental in helping Hitler come to power. When the Nazis were blessed by the Catholic system to kill six million Jews, in effect. The Vatican and the Holocaust links have been whitewashed. The Vatican knows how to cover its tracks very well. The Vatican opposed the Jewish state. They made no objection to Hitler's policies. And today they're silent about Zionism. They're silent about any organisations whose objectives are to wipe out Israel off the map. They don't say a word. They're silent. They didn't want a Jewish state. Here's a Catholic leader reported in the Jerusalem Post in 2007, rejecting the Jewish state. Israel's identity as a Jewish state discriminates against non-Jews. That was his statement. The Holy Land's top Roman Catholic told reporters in a pre-Christmas address in 2007, in effect, we don't believe in a Jewish state. That's the system. How much do you remember about Benedict, Pope Benedict? We remember a lot about Pope John Paul. Not so much about Benedict. But you might remember, or you may not know, that in 2009, he went to Israel. There's a meeting with President Perez in Israel. They didn't even want the state. Don't agree with it. But there he was to be seen. And here's another incident. He went to Germany and there was a Muslim controversy over what he said in Germany. And if you pull this up on the internet, they say, oh, he was losing it, this, this Pope, you know, he said things that he really didn't know what he was on about. What did he say? What was the controversy? Anyone remember it? Well, this is what it was. On that visit, he quoted from a 14th century Byzantine emperor's debate with a Persian monarch. This was just before the fall of Constantinople. Just before the Turks took Constantinople from Rome. And in a debate, 
This was quoted, and here are the quotation. Well, here's the quotation. Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only inhuman, such as his commander spread by sword the faith he preached. That's what he quoted. There was an absolute uproar because what he was saying, that faith should not be imposed by force like the Muslim faith. He got into a lot of trouble for that. Do you think he just flippantly put that out? He's a cle he was a clever man. But it's also a little bit rich for the Roman Catholics to say that too, isn't it? Look at their history. By force. Die or be a Catholic. The popes know this, that if Rome is to return to its former glory, they need to unite all Catholics. The best way to get a unification, look at the cultural base. Europe is the cultural base. The Catholics of Europe. Islam poses a great threat to Catholicism in Europe. Therefore, provide the people of Europe to a single common cause. And what's Europe trying to handle today as a common cause? The threat of Islam. And we see that right now with all the issues. France had its elections today. The normal ruling parties kicked out. People are frightened. They want change. And the big issue in Europe today, we're seeing it in 2017, Islam. What about Turkey trying to get into the EU? For years, Turkey's been trying to join the European Union. We were in Turkey in 2004 and our guide that we had at the time going around the seven ecclesias said every time we put up all these statements about why we should join the EU, they give us more, we fulfil them, we get more. He said the real reason they don't want us there is because Europe is Catholic and has a trinity and we believe in one God. That's what he told us. And they're still not in the EU. And that was 13 years ago. Constantinople. You go to Constantinople, Hagia Sophia, of course, was the original site for the church set up by Constantine when Christianity became the religious system in the Roman Catholic pagan world. Prior to that, became the official religious system. And it was built, in that current one was built in 537 became the spiritual centre of the Eastern Roman Empire. Today, it's Muslim, Ottoman Turk. Then you go and look inside. It's absolutely brilliant. What's inside? Oh, sorry, today it's not Muslim. It's now changed from Muslim into a museum. And here's the museum. The Muslim place now, of course, is the Blue Mosque. And that was built in... 1609 to 1616, and that's the great mosque of Istanbul. And you're probably quite familiar with that slide called the Three Romes. Why was it called the Three Romes? Well, you had Rome on the left there, the headquarters of the Roman Empire when it began, then it became the western section of the Roman Empire, when over to the right to Constantinople, you had the second leg of the Roman Empire, it's Daniel's or Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel. So there was the papacy in Rome, and there was the military base or the civil base in Constantinople. But of course, in 1453, the Ottoman Turks removed the Roman power. And the Byzantine church went up to Moscow. And hence, Moscow became, by many, to be known as the Third Rome. 
And in Moscow today, you have the leader of the Orthodox Church there, and here's 2009. As a new leader of the Russian Orthodox Church arises, so does the possibility of closer ties with the Pope and his Vatican, bringing closer the re-emergence of the Christian Empire created by Constantine. They've never, ever forgotten that Constantinople was taken by the Turk. Well, in this photograph, you might not be able to see it very well there, but there are three crosses up on the top of the church, and here's a closer one, and there's the cross, and underneath is the moon. And the crescent moon is the symbol for Turkey. It's what's on her flag. The cross on top of the moon. We will go back to Constantinople at some stage. And of course, we're very familiar with the drying up of the river Euphrates and the drying up of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire and the position that Russia has and all that. But here's the religious side of things. They want to go back to Constantinople. They want their eastern section of the Roman Empire back as far as the religious system is concerned. Interesting things that we are seeing here. Over the years I've collected uh, articles that have been in the paper. Now this is the first one, 1966. Pope sees red today. The first time a Pope has received a communist person. 66. In 71, there was a Vatican Kremlin toast. Even five years ago, a picture such as this would have been unimaginable. Someone from the papacy having anything to do with communist Russia. That was in 71. By 88, the church and the Soviet state moved closer. Now, between 71 and 88, around about 1980, after Rathmines Bible School, we had a lecture at, at Boularoo in the township dealing with the links between the papacy and Russia. And the brethren put these big stands in trailers all around the town advertising this lecture. Well, those big boards in the trailers all got spray painted and at the lecture there were all these people came who were Catholics and I still remember it was a pretty wet evening and this woman stood up when, when things were indicating what the scripture taught about the papacy in Russia and she had an umbrella in her hand she said never, never, never will this happen never will the Pope have anything to do with Russia I wonder if she's still alive today what she would say We know what our Bible teaches. 1989, Moscow to adopt a free religion war, a free, free religion law. And this was an interesting cartoon. Who's the one really in power? Versus little Russia. The movement in the papacy. The long-term goal, control in Europe. Interesting. And of course now, here's President Putin and Pope Benedict, 2007. Francis and Putin today. Who would have thought that 30 years ago? Well, we come down to Pope Francis now. End of last year, he went to Sweden. Look at all the key players, the leaders, the king, the queen, the leaders of the church, the Lutheran church. And there's Pope Francis. Well, in Revelation 17, John responded to the invitation. They've been made drunk, the people with the wine. 
He described the beast on which this woman was sitting, an ecclesiastical system made drunk. And so he was carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. It really was a wilderness literally in those days, of course, when this was written. Most of Europe was a wilderness. It was also a wilderness right through the Holy Roman Empire spiritually, but it was only down around the Mediterranean where you had Greeks, Greek and Roman history and uh, society and so on. The rest was considered a wilderness to the north. The woman was arrayed in scarlet and purple and so on. This woman that sat upon a scarlet-coloured beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns, and his scarlet, speaking of sin, all these things come through mine. And then, of course, as, as this woman's being described here, we're reminded of Daniel 7, came out of the, the pagan Roman era, and there are the horns. And then, of course, she came through to Revelation 13, and there was the beast of the sea, all this comes to mind here and there are the horns and, and the heads and so on. All these links with Daniel and Revelation back in 13. Seven heads, ten horns, a collective beast now putting together the elements of Europe again. Ten horns from the dividing up of the Roman Empire. But it's still future. This is still future. Not ten separate, one. Brother Thomas saw that quite clearly. Speaking blasphemy. The names of blasphemy. Speaking against God. We are living in an age that's very anti-God. People may call themselves Christian in some, some cases, but really there's an anti-God feeling. People, events, institutions, doctrines or something... So on, against the gospel of God, of the truth. That's the environment we're living in. And here's this woman sitting. She's riding the beast. She's sitting on it, which means she has her own destiny and in controlling it, richly decked out. There's all the sense of royalty with gold and precious stones and pearls. And popes travel the world today. In the past, people went to Rome to see the Pope. Not anymore. The Pope's travelling everywhere, riding the beast, in effect, of the future that we're going to see come out. Here's all the preparations, not realising that in the end, they'll come to judgement. And the people, they're taken in by it. And it mentions there a golden cup. Here's the Polish Pope, John Paul, in all his robes with matches up with a scarlet. And then in the hand of that woman is a cup, a golden cup, a very evil woman, entirely unrepentant, bold, offering herself to mankind, queen of the universe. This is the sort of language. There are the evil doctrines in that cup, bearing the name of Christ, but called by Christ an adulteress. How long has that language fitted the papacy? Well, here are a few examples. We'll just run through. In 1602, there are coins, Pope Clements, and there's the cup in the hand. By 1828, same type of coin. There's the cup in the hand. Pope Pius XII, cup in the hand. Pope John XXIII, cup in the hand. Pope Paul VI, cup in the hand. On all the coins, and you can go on and on and on, but all these coins, symbols of the papacy, and there's the woman with a cup in the hand every time. Straight out of Revelation. There's the woman with a cup in the hand. And it says, mystery. What a mystery this system is. Well, on that photograph with Mass... At uh, that funeral, look at the security guards. Look at their dress. Everything about Rome is a mystery. Who dresses like that? It's a mystery. 
If you ever go to the Vatican, everything about it, mystery. And the symbols and so on linked with pagan idolatry. The place is full of it. And so you then have mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Well, if you go to the area where you have St. Peter's Square over there, there's a little uh, painting on one of the buildings. You look closer and there it is, Mary and the child. And underneath is Mater Ecclesia, mother of the church. She's the mother of the church. And of course, it's Mary. Pope John Paul probably pushed Mary more than any other pope. Mary. What a system. When we go back to Revelation chapter 14, Christ earlier on recorded, I looked and lo, or told John to record, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. What a difference. Just coming a little further, we come back to that photo. End of last year, the Pope went to Sweden. Now it was in Sweden, Wittenberg, in the 14th century that the Reformation began. And you remember how at the Wittenberg Church in Germany, Martin Luther nailed up a whole list of things that were Catholic teachings that were not in the Bible. 95 statements. There's the church today. And they've replaced the doors into that church and engraved on these doors here, bronze doors now, because the original ones got burnt down in a fire in 1760, and they've taken these bronze ones and engraved all the statements. And now the Pope is there celebrating the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation. And that photograph shows him leading a service in a Lutheran church celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation. She says she's the mother of all the churches. And the Protestant churches are really like daughters today and she's working on that. The only church is the Catholic church. And there's Prince Charles saying he will be a leader of all faiths. These are the days in which we're living, brethren and sisters. The words of Revelation are true. Incredible. We come back to Revelation 17. And it went on to say that John was absolutely, he wondered with great admiration. It's a terrible translation, admiration to admire something. He didn't admire it. He was absolutely astonished, as the word means, with what he saw. Now keep in mind the overall picture. It says here in verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and at the end of that verse, and yet is. It was, it's not, and yet is. Now remember when Christ wrote this, of course, the system wasn't as we've known it through history. It was still pagan Rome. In chapter 16, you had those first five vials when judgments were poured out upon Catholic Europe, beginning with the French Revolution, with Napoleon and so on, the Napoleonic Wars, Pope put into exile, the land stripped, churches mocked and so on. That was the beast that was. And then you come to the sixth vial, our day, the river Euphrates, Turkey drying up, nations preparing for war, that's our day, the return of Christ, Armageddon, nothing to do with the papacy. The beast was not. Then the seventh vial, great Babylon, the beast that is future. Yeah, it is. And it mentions there in the record 
In Revelation 17 and verse 9, the seven heads are seven mountains. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is and the other is not. Now in Christ's day, what you had was this picture. Seven heads, and it said five of them are fallen. Five were gone by the time Revelation was written. At that stage then they had the imperial system. Then that was to go for a little while and the Gothic system took over and then of course Roman Empire became Christianity, a Christian empire. The Gothic system only lasted for what, 60 years? It was when all those nations came down and swarmed into the Roman Empire and you had the 10 nations come out of the Roman Empire. So the re-emergence of, re of this beast is like the imperial one coming back again. It said there, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, one of the seven. A return to the imperial one, the time of the head in Rome leading up leading up to and part of Christian Rome. So here's the woman riding the beast. And you look at today, and what do we see in Europe? Well, originally at Strasbourg, of course, was a key place as far as unity in Europe was concerned. The Council of Europe met there in 1955. They met in a 15th century Catholic cathedral called the Notre Dame Cathedral there and there they presented a stained glass window it was unveiled in 56 and there you have Our Lady Queen of Europe the flag of the 12 stars was launched that was the Council of Europe. It's not the European Union. It was the Council of Europe. Later on, the European market and then the European Union as we know it today took that flag as their symbol. And so today, you've got that flag with the 12 stars. It's all linked back to that woman. It's linked back to Mary. It's linked back to the birth of Constantine. There was the woman with the 12 stars. See, here's the papacy, always there in Europe. And so you had Strasbourg, the old EU headquarters. It's no longer there. But it has been there for a long time. And since the EU, of course, you had out came all the depictions of Time magazine and so on, the woman riding the beast, riding a, a beast, a symbol of Europe, crowned with the 12 stars and some we've seen so many of them. There's the papacy still involved in Europe. The Armageddon will start with the military judgment. Then will come the religious judgment. Stage one with Russia, stage two with the papacy. Well, from Strasbourg up to Brussels, Brussels now has the headquarters of the new EU's just been opened. And there's the new building, and inside, very, very modern. Some people laugh about it they, with all the colours that are inside, but there's the, neat, the new EU headquarters. So what happens? Verse 14, this beast, this system, this religious confederacy, this religious Europe will make war with the Lamb. So the Russian go destroyed. Now here's Catholic Europe saying Christ is an antichrist and they make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. The end of the religious power of Europe. And in the record it indicates to us that it's really like in the judgments when you come to chapter 18, look at the things that are said in chapter 18. Babylon the great is fallen in verse 2. All the nations have drunk of her wrath. 
come out of her, my people, an opportunity. They've lived deliciously or luxuriously in verse 7. That's how much she glorified herself. She sat as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'm no longer out of it. I've come back on the scene. This was the language of the woman on that beast. And in one day, judgment. And standing afar off for fear of a torment, where nations saying, Babylon, verse 10, that great city, in one hour is her judgment come. One hour, destroyed. Gone. And it speaks about, in the record there, when you come down to verse 21 of chapter 18, and a mighty angel took up a stone. Took up a stone. Maybe our minds go to Daniel chapter 2, the stone that will smash the kingdoms of men at their feet. Well, here it's a millstone. And in the NIV it has a donkey millstone in its translation, meaning a stone so large that a donkey would be needed to move it. A mighty angel took up a stone, a donkey stone, or took up a stone like a donkey stone and cast it into the sea. It would sink forever. Be found no more. And meanwhile, brethren and sisters, we wait. Behold, I come. Like a thief. Thief comes when we're not watching. We must be people who are watching, seeing the things that Christ knew were going to happen. He listed them all off. He knew all the stories, the history that we've seen over the last, what, 2,000 years. We've got a revelation to thank for. We understand these things. So, let us rejoice. Let us be glad that of all people we've been given an understanding of these things. And let us give honour to the one we remember this morning for the marriage of our Lord and us, we pray, is about to be a reality. The issue is, let us be a wife that's ready.